please welcome Brian Margin. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and I'll try to keep it brief because it's boring. Uh, I'm Brian Largent. I own an IT company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We primarily work in healthcare, so we're what's called a managed service provider, and we provide health or IT services for mainly healthcare providers, hospitals, rural hospitals, small practices, and so on. And this is a, a totally new presentation for me, so if you'll bear with me, hopefully we'll get some value out of this. Um, but this is new. I normally talk on technology, cybersecurity, you know, all that stuff. That's, that's my bread and butter. But I've been in this industry for 20 plus years. I worked for other companies. I've worked at, you know, like, like my bio says, I worked from, it's really, I need to have that change because it goes from being an engineer down to help desk. I actually went the other direction, I promise. So I started help desk, kind of worked my way up to engineer, architect, designing and infrastructure. But I've been everywhere. I've, I've worked for every company in town, Fortune 500 companies, I've worked for small companies, I've managed IT teams, and then I started my business about 14 years ago, and I manage a team with my business. And in doing so, I learned a lot, uh, a whole lot. Uh, and a lot of my assumptions when I worked for other companies changed when I started to manage people within those companies, and they changed even more when I started a company of my own. And so we're going to go through some of those things, some of my lessons learned, some things that I found valuable. And, and again, I hope you guys can get some value out of this. So, and I've been doing this a while. I, I was looking today, I was like, uh, this year I'm gonna be 600 months old. So that, that means I'll be turning 50 this year. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, still going and uh, been in IT for a while, so. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about, has anyone read this book? Does that look familiar? Um, if you manage a staff, this is a must read book. Uh, Daniel Pink, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And, and what's so important about this book is you learn about the different types of motivation. There's motivation 1.0, which is the carrot or the stick. You guys are familiar with the carrot or the stick? You know, either you're going to get rewarded with a bonus or a salary, or you're going to get hit with the stick if you don't perform, right? And there's motivation 2.0, and that is the joy of the task. So in this book, Daniel Pink, uh, he, he talks about an experiment where these scientists took a whole bunch of monkeys and they put them in, a, in an area, and they introduced this latch. It's much more complex than this, but they introduced this latch into the monkeys, and the goal was to figure out how do incentives work with monkeys? How do they, you know, and how can they relate that to humans? So they put this latch in with the monkeys, but before they could even incentivize the monkeys, they fought each other on who could do it first. And so these monkeys are fighting to do this, no incentive whatsoever, fighting to do this, who gets to do it, and they're just constantly lining it up and fighting to, to work this latch system, and it's a multi-step system. When they figure it out, they go through it over and over. Well, the scientists are just stumped. They're like, this is, we haven't done anything to get them to want to do this. And so, so they, they decide, let's see what happens when we insert motivation. We give them something to make them want to do it. So every time they do it, they give them a little treat. Well, after a while, they took the treat away. Well, what do you think happened? The monkeys never did the thing that they loved doing once the treat was gone. You know, you introduce the treat, they only do it and then hold out their hand to get the treat, right? So what that is, that defines motivation 2.0. It's the joy of the task. It's the joy of doing well in what you do. And today's presentation, our target audience <laughs> is intrinsically motivated high performers looking for extrinsic compensation and or acknowledgement. You know, you're working hard, you're really good at your job, and maybe people don't see it, okay? As an IT guy working in corporate America all the way to my own company, I've learned that a lot of times in IT people don't know what we do. They, they don't understand what we do. And because they don't know and they don't understand, they have you do things like go move desks when a new office is being built, right? How many here, who here is a HIPAA compliance officer? Did, did they kind of just walk up to you and go, we, we have to do this now, now you, you know computers, now you're the HIPAA compliance officer, right? Right, that's, that's how that went. And the liability that goes with that's pretty tremendous, especially if you're in a hospital, right? So, so people don't always understand what we do. So what I'm gonna be trying to do today is help you guys understand how to use some of the tools that we use with our clients and with others to show our value because we're doing it for money, not just as an employee, but we're doing it where we have to show value because they'll fire us if we can't show value, right? So we're gonna go through a few of those things. So first of all, none of us are altruistic, right? We don't do everything just because we, we wanna do it. We have to be compensated. So altruism is the belief in or practice of, of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. It doesn't mean we don't care about others, but we do have our own interests, and you have to feed those interests, okay? 
So we don't do things for free. We don't work for companies for free. We're not there to just support them only. We also have to get something in exchange. That's just a natural way of living life, natural way of being employed. So a little bit about my background. Um, I drove a forklift, pretty glamorous. I traded and dispatched electricity. And believe it or not, I went from driving a forklift to trading and dispatching electricity in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I worked for Williams Energy. Um, I went into help desk support. I gave up a very lucrative job to take a cut and pay to go do help desk support because it's a passion I had. I enjoyed it, wanted to get into that industry. Then I went to another company where I did help desk support, but they gave me a title called systems analyst. So they didn't know what help desk was. So they, everyone was a systems analyst. And then I became a network administrator, systems administrator, systems architect. Later, I became an IT manager. Trial by fire, right? If you've never been a manager and someone puts you in charge of people, you learn some really good lessons really quick. So the first lesson I learned whenever I became a manager was the, the whole Daniel Pink book I was talking about. I went into this company, it was a small company, about 100 employees. I went into this company, they had two IT guys, no manager at all. They were answering directly to the owner of the company. It wasn't healthcare, it was a, a import-export company. And I came in and I looked at their salaries and these guys were making minimum wage, traveling all over the United States, setting up booths. <laughs> IT guys, guys who set up very complex systems for this organization. And I came in and I was like, whoa, that isn't gonna work. You know, I, I, you can't pay these guys less than 35, 45,000 a year to do that kind of work. So, so I came in with my wisdom, my, my literally minutes of wisdom, and I raised both their salaries. Immediately, I, well not immediately, but pretty quick after that, they stopped working hard. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? You would think you, you give someone a raise, but they saw their value as then way higher. It was not a gradual progression for them to grow. They saw their value really high, and then they started to demand things from me. And they saw it as a pushover, right? That, that this guy came in, wow, he gave us a whole lot of money, now where we should be. Well, actually, we should be even more than that, right? So I learned a very valuable lesson. Everything needs to be done in time, and it needs to be done progressive. So, as you see, I didn't like that job very much. I went back to being a system architect, design and engineering, because I, I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to manage people. I didn't know how to manage expectations, right? And there's a way to do that. There's a right way to do that. So I started to figure some of that out. I got an opportunity to be an IT manager again. And when I came in, they brought me in. They said, our IT team is in disarray. It's, it's a real mess. And we need you to come in and kind of line it out. My first day on the job, no one showed up for work in my entire IT department. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, I start calling around, I, like, what's going on? I said, oh, well, there was a problem with the server last night. We were all up all night trying to work on the server. I'm, okay, well, I'm going to go log into the server because I'm an IT guy, I'm not just a manager. And I'm going to go look at the logs to see who logged into the server last night. How many people do you think logged into the server last night? Zero. Zero. And they'd been pulling the wool over this organization for years. And so none of those people work there anymore. <laughs> so... So I did that for about a year and a half, two years, um, and then uh, started my company not too shortly after that, and have been doing that since. So, so this, I like this, this saying, mediocrity, mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself, but talent instantly recognizes genius. So I told you guys, you're not altruistic, but that doesn't mean you don't care about other people, right? You're not going to get promoted, you're not going to get opportunity, and, and you don't want people that work for you that are only self-interested. So just make sure that even though you're looking for value in your own life and, and an organization to invest in you, that you don't forget the other people around you. You need to recognize what they're doing as well. So know the metrics that matter. And this is kind of the core of what I want to talk about today. What are the metrics for your job that show the value you bring to the organization? Do, do, does anyone here have a ticketing system that you work within right now? So I see one hand. Um, how do you guys show your value? I'm guessing that you get performance reviews about every six months or a year or so. Is that, does that sound right? Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about some of these things. So catalog your wins. Does anyone journal what they're doing and how they're succeeding and providing value for their organization? I mean, we kind of remember it. We know we're succeeding and maybe you're getting acknowledged, but are you writing it down? I do. You do? Because I'm a square. <laughs> That's fantastic. You have a question? I don't, no, I was going to say, I don't write it down, but because I'm an appeals coordinator, I see the ones that I overturn yep. on a spreadsheet every week, so <laughs> oh, wow. it's written down somewhere. I don't do it. 
And, but as an individual, and even as your employees, you owe it to them to encourage them to write down their wins. Because you're not going to remember them. I don't remember the wins for all my guys, right? So you need to get those wins written down, track them, okay? So when you do that, have a little bit of a blueprint to it. What was the objective that you were trying to accomplish, right? Is, was it a, a one-off, like if you're working in a medical record system, are you building forms for doctors to be able to do something? Um, what was the task that you took to accomplish that? Who did you have to communicate with? How many departments did you work with? Uh, what was the outcome? What was the value you brought to the organization? Especially if you can put a monetary number on that. Because we're overhead, right? I mean, I mean we don't make money for our, our customers. I mean, I'm overhead, I know that. So, so, um, so if you failed, and this happens, we all fail. As an employer myself, if someone fails underneath me, you know what I want to hear? What did you learn? How will you avoid future failures? If I hear that out of someone instead of a, oh, woe is me, <laughs> you know, or it's not my fault, it's someone else's fault, and you know, that, that doesn't resonate with me. I, show me how you're gonna fix it next time and not let it happen. If you come at me with that, I will tolerate a million failures because as long as you're learning, it's not the same failure every time, of course, but as long as you're learning, I, I, I appreciate it when someone fails, but they learn from it. And if it's success, Hooray, what did you learn from that? You should be documenting all these things. This is how you show your value, okay? And know your value. It's not enough to just document these things. This is not trumping up who you are. This is about knowing who you are, knowing what value you bring to the organization. So I looked this up. I always love these kinds of stats. I Googled how to get promoted. There was 236 million results. How to buy a car, there's 18 billion results. <laughs> So there's a lot of people looking to buy a car that don't care if they get promoted. <laughs> so um, you might want to get promoted before you buy a car, or at least you know do something to improve your lot in life. So this is one of my favorites. As, a, as an employer myself, I have a rule with my, my guys. If they come to me with a problem, if I can find the answer in the first page of Google results, they're in trouble. Because that's my job. I mean, that's everyone's job in the company is Google anymore, right? We don't go to the encyclopedias to look things up. We use Google. Everyone uses Google. Every job uses Google. If someone comes to you and asks you a question and they can't come up with at least some form of answer before they ask you, it's not going to do you any good. They're wasting your time. And what we really want to do, uh, well, I'll get back into that. So what we really want to do is we want to provide, or we want our employees to save us time, make our lives easier, okay? That's, that's their job. We've got plenty of work on our plate as managers. We need our employees to make our lives easier. We want to do that for our managers as well. I think I got my slides a little out of order here. So overhead you are, act like it, you must not, okay? <laughs> if you're overhead and you don't feel like you bring value to the organization, the organization doesn't think you bring value to them either. You know, a lot of organizations look at IT, they're overhead, and they try to squeeze your budget. They try to make you do a bunch of things. Like I said, moving desks around. I've, I don't know how many companies I worked for where I had to move desks around, uh, move chairs. I had, I worked for a company, a big energy company. We had 300 racks. They had us go unbox them all day long for eight hours with a bunch of systems engineers and architects unboxing racks all day. There's no value in that for the organization, but they didn't know what we do. You know, the only thing they know is if things aren't burning down, they're doing their jobs. If things are burning down, oh, clearly we didn't do our job right, right? So, so how to not act like your overhead is to show, figure out how you bring value to the organization. Again, show your value to the people that you work with. And this isn't in your face showing your value. This is actually, what are you doing? You're bringing value every day. When you go into, those, into the office, into the hospital, wherever you're at, you are bringing value, but you gotta know what you're doing and what you're bringing and articulate it. Learn new things in your own time. This is a really tough one for me as an employer. When I have, a, I, I have my staff and I'll, I'll go to them and I say, we need someone to learn this phone system. We're gonna be deploying a new phone system. We've chosen this product. I need, I need my team to learn this system. If my team says to me, are you gonna pay me to do that? Well, are, are you gonna stay here forever at that salary if I do? Because you're gonna get to take that knowledge somewhere else. This is an investment in your future, right? It doesn't mean you can't learn on the job. But what I'm looking for is for my team to actually go, I see value for me. I'm learning something. I'm getting value out of this. And they see that value and they run with it and they own it. So when I say learn things, new things on your own time, that's a very bold statement. I don't mean all the time. But I mean a lot of the time you need to be investing in your growth and your maturity within the organization. And if you're doing that and the organization does not acknowledge that, you got a problem. I changed jobs every two years before I started my own business. 
I did that for 20 years or so. I learned a lot about how to show my value because I didn't know how to do it. And so I had to change jobs to show my value everywhere I went. I would hit a, I would hit a plateau and, and this is kind of a side story. So I would hit a plateau and, and the plateau was always this. We hired you to do a job when we brought you in. You're always seen as the guy that does that job. And then they would hire someone over that level, over me, because they hired that guy to do that job. Anyone ever seen this before? It's like a phenomenon. So they're not looking at you for promotion because you were the guy that was brought into that position, right? So how do you overcome that? Well, that's basically what we're trying to talk about today. How do you show your value so that when those things happen, when those opportunities come up, they look internally at you and say, are you right for that position? If you're not building your resume, documenting what you're doing, documenting the value to bring to the organization, when those conversations happen, you're not going to be able to prove your value to the organization, especially if you have a manager change and they don't remember you and they don't know who you are. So cre create those logs. <clears throat> make, uh, I mentioned this, make your manager's life easier. And your manager's manager. And your manager's manager's manager. And your manager's 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 manager. So, I said that without actually stuttering. I'm pretty proud of myself. So the, the point is, is, is you know, if, if I started my company, if I can run it all myself, I'm not hiring anyone, right? I don't want to run it all myself. I want to bring people in that make, take workload off me. And if you're in a corporation, it's the same. People bring you in so you can take workload off them. If you're bringing work to them, that's not good. And by bringing work to them, I mean, if you're coming to someone, like if I have someone come to me and they say, I've got this problem, and that's where, the, that's where the discussion ends. Well, why are you talking to me? I, I, you're, not, you're not taking workload off me. I need you to take workload off me. So how are you going to do that? Come up with solutions to the problems you bring to me. If they're not good solutions, that's fine, but give me at least a couple of options. And when you do that, I'm, I am all ears. I am excited. I mean, and I don't get that a lot. A lot of the times what I get, whenever I bring in especially young people that have not been in the business world a long time, there's a wall. And in that wall, they hit it, and they stop. You guys seen this? And there's a lot, of, a lot of young people out right now that really struggle with that. They've hit the wall, and they can't get around the wall. They don't know how to get around the wall. They want you to lift them up over the wall. You have to teach people how to do that if they work for you, and if you're one doing it, stop doing it. Always figure out a way around the wall. It may not be a good way around the wall, but figure a way out around the wall. <clears throat> Tools, okay. This is where my business thrives. Without tools, without the, the, these tools, we don't have a business. Because I bill by the hour for my time. And when I talk to hospitals, a lot of times I talk to their IT departments. And, you know, a lot of these smaller rural hospitals, their IT departments, you know, one person or, or what have you. And they're kind of doing everything. And I'll say, you know, why, why, do, they, why do they have you doing X, Y, Z? You know, why, why are you out putting chairs in, you know, painting walls? Why are you doing those things? Well, you know, they don't really know what I do. And, and you know, I'm, I'm overworked and I'm doing all these other things. Well, how are you going to show your value? I mean, people put in tickets, right? And he said, well, no, they just send me an email. Oh, okay. So you get an email, and then what do you do with it? Well, I, I, I work it, and then I move it over to the deleted items, and I'm done. Well, how much time do you put into those? How do you, how do you track the amount of time that you're putting into what you're doing? Well, I don't. I work an eight-hour day, or a 12-hour day, or a 16-hour day, or whatever, and you know, I just expect that they're going to know that I'm working. So the way the hospital, when I go to the administration, I ask them, I say, hey, you've got, you know, I'm just going to use a name, Joe over here. He's doing your IT. How do you know he's performing? Well, that's why we brought you in. We're not real sure Joe's performing. Well, you got Joe, you know, putting up, lam putting laminate flooring in, so um, why are you doing that? Well, we don't know what he does, so that, that's a way to keep him busy. Like, well, let's, let's go install an all-clear signal in the hospital, and any time there's no problems with your IT, this all clear signal is going to go off. And so when there are problems, it'll, go, it, it'll, it'll not be on. <laughs> so we're going to do an inverse. So, okay, how long would that be going off if we install this signal? And he said, well, we haven't had any problems in a long time. So your assumption is that Joe's not working because your network's not burning to the ground. Maybe Joe's doing his job right. You know, we get that as an IT company, as an outsourced IT company, all the time. So. And we've had ways, and I'll get into that in a minute, of trying to, to deal with that. Because you go into a hospital or a company, and you rebuild everything, usually. Because usually it's a wreck. When they finally get to us, it's a wreck. They need it rebuilt. We put in new firewalls, all new security systems, and it's not cheap. I mean, if any of you guys have ever priced that, it is not cheap to redo everything. 
So we tell people it's about $150 to $300 per user per month to do IT right. That's with security and everything. That's support, everything. That's not cheap. That's a lot more than most companies are willing to pay. But once you do it and the problems go away, what do you think happens with management? You know, upper management, they're like, why are we paying all this money? They fixed everything. So Microsoft releases a new operating system every five years and obsoletes the old one. So is it going to be fixed in five years? It's going to start all over again, right? So, so back to this. I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here. Back to this. So we use a ticketing system because we bill all our time. Our clients expect us to show them the value we bring to their organization. If you're in a decent size organization, I would say pretty much any organization, if you can commoditize what you do and you can put time against it, you should be tracking that in some form of system that allows you to put time against the work that you're doing. You're going to hate it. I hated it. Years ago, I worked for an energy company and they wanted to put a ticketing system in. I was on a trading floor, uh, I was doing IT at this time, and it was a real hustle and bustle organization. We all knew we were really good at our jobs. We're all just fixing things for all these traders, about 900 people or so on this trading floor. And we're running around and they said, we're gonna put a ticketing system in so we know what you guys are doing. I'm like, well, what do you mean? It really got my feathers ruffled, right? You know, what do you mean? I, I'm working here, you don't, you know, who do you think you are? You know, I'm busting my butt. And so I hated it. I hated it. You know, company ended up having some downturn. Everyone got laid off. Big mess. Time goes by. I'm managing people. I don't know what they do. I mean, I'm an IT guy. I can go in there and I can get into the servers. I can look at the logs like I was talking about before. I can see some things, but I can't see everything, right? And if I'm doing that, it's a lot of work for me. So I was like, hmm, maybe I need to put a ticketing system in. <laughs> So I did. So I went and I researched and I found a whole bunch of ticketing systems out there and I put them in. And I got the same pushback. I mean, it's karma, right? So my team's like, hey, we're busting our butts. You know we're doing our jobs. We keep getting good performance evaluations. Why are you putting this ticketing system in? Because I have to know. I have to be able to prove to management what you're doing. So short answer is ticketing systems are not fun. But my gosh, there is no better tool in the world to show your value. Ticketing systems and project management systems. If you work more on projects like you're building EMRs, get one in place. They're not real expensive. There's tons of them out there. There's even open source ones out there. It is the best way for you to track what's going on. If you can tie an email account to that system, even better. So now people are sending you emails into a ticketing system where you can track and send emails back and forth. Wow. You talk about efficiency. You can then have metrics and you can report on that information and you can show value to the organization. It works really well. I have to do it because my guys get paid by the hour. I have to show the value on my bottom line. So I run reports on how much time people are putting into every single thing they do. We categorize by type, subtype, and item. So if I need to know what user at one of my client sites is chewing up most of the support hours so I can report to the owner of that organization, I can do that. Well, Joe forgets his password every two days. And so we've got to do a 15 minute ticket to go reset Joe's password, get him back in there. And sometimes that's 30 minutes to an hour because Joe stepped away from his phone and his computer and now we've got to have someone go track him down and I've got a text sitting on the phone. You know, so I'm tracking that. So the, the, at, you know, we go to the customer and we say, you know, here's your bill for the month. And they say, wow, that's really high. Why is that so high? Well, you know, Joe can't remember his password. Now it's a disciplinary thing, right? Not on you, it's not you. Why, why are we spending so much money? In my case, money. In, you, in your case, why can't you get things done? Well, it's because you have an employee who's the problem. So, um, so anyway, um, create, generate regular reports for management, departments, et cetera. Those are so key. Again, if you get a ticketing system or a project management system in place, uh, run those reports, sit down in meetings. Whether they look at them or not is immaterial, okay? When it comes time for you to actually sit down and let's talk raise, they're going to look at them then, right? You're going to show them to them then. But give them the reports. They may just put them in their waste bin. It doesn't matter. It also creates plausible deniability, right? Well, what do you do? Well, I've been sending it to you for six months. <laughs> so um, you've got the reports. Well, I don't look at those. Okay. Where do we go with this? <laughs> I've been giving you the information. <laughs> so um, all communications flow through a ticket. If you get a ticket system, if you do that project management system, stop using your email to talk to the employees inside the organization. Just stop doing it. It has to go through a ticket. Someone stops you in the hall and says, hey, can you come look at this? No, I cannot. You have to set up that culture in the organization. That's a hard one to set up because they're probably used to grabbing anyone as they walk down the hall. I know because I've, I've been that guy 
where you're just you're walking and and someone's like, hey, I got this problem or I need this or look at that. You're never going to get anything done. You already guys already struggle with that. I'm sure I did. I struggled with it for years. I need you to put a ticket in. Get management to buy in at upper levels. Get them to buy into that mentality. It's not an easy one to do. You know how you get buy in? You get a ticketing system and you show every time you were stopped in the hallway by Joe and because he forgot his password and you put that in every time. And once you've documented that, you go back to the organization and you say, look, if people stop bothering me in the hall, I could be productive. <laughs> and here's how much time I'm spending stopping what I'm doing to go do this other thing. So it's really, really beneficial. Uh, communicate regularly with stakeholders. This is another key in my industry that was really important for us as a business. I think it's probably going to be very important for you guys. Communication's key. If you're not using a ticketing system, you know how easy it is to lose communication in an email? I mean, do you guys like take things in email and you throw them in your calendar and then you're trying to keep up with the calendar items but you had something else come up and that one got missed, so you're looking at it the next day and then someone's yelling at you because, hey, I asked you to do this and you never got it done. Anyone had that problem before? Okay. If you got a project management system and a ticketing system, you can do things like workflows. They're awesome. What workflows do is they do things like, if someone, and we do this and I love it, so someone puts a ticket in with you and it's uh, computer's broke, computer's slow, whatever it might be. So they put the ticket in and you respond back to them, hey, I can meet you at your desk, my first available is this time. And they never respond. Who's responsible when that doesn't get fixed? That's you, right? But if you have a workflow rule that actually sends them three emails and then escalates to their manager automatically that they haven't responded, and then it closes the ticket, who's responsible? Them. We had to do that because we were having so much struggle with my guys tracking down clients. They would put in a ticket, then we could never get them to be at their desk or whatever, and so we had to have that system. It just automatically dings them several times in an email, and if they don't respond, we close the ticket out. So with them, when they complain, which happens, it's, you know, hey, we put this in and no one will ever solve it. Well, it shows here that we sent you four emails trying to schedule a time and no one responded. We sent you a final email that said we closed the ticket. Wouldn't that be nice? It is. <laughs> so ticketing system, tracking your work, it's, it's more work, it's more effort on your part, but again, it shows your value. It's tremendous. I wish every organization that we work with did it. All right. Own the ticket. Once you create a ticket in a ticketing system, you own it. Don't, don't do this. Don't send someone an email and then just think they're going to respond or send them a ticket uh, update and just think they're going to respond. You've got to own it. And that goes back to kind of the workflow rules. It'll actually uh, manage a lot of that ownership for you so that you're putting it on them and not on yourself. But, but do own the tickets. Don't hand it off to someone else and expect them to handle it. Okay? In our organization, we do what's called single touch resolution. That means that when someone calls my organization for support, the person at the lowest level of my organization owns that. Even if he has to escalate to someone else, he walks over to that desk and he stands next to that sysadmin and he says, here's what I've got, I can't get it resolved myself, I own this, can you do this right now? If the guy says no, he has to go back to the customer and communicate to the customer. Because the person who owns the ticket is gonna be the one that's gonna be able to solve the problem. But if you escalate and you give it to other people in my organization, the first thing they look at you is like, yeah, this reminds me of calling India support for Microsoft, you know? <laughs> You know, you got 12 people and now you got a committee and they're all trying to decide how to fix whatever the problem is and they can't decide so they put you on hold and then they hang up on you, right? So you, you don't want to give your, for me it's a customer, but your end user is your customer, that's who you're serving. You don't want to give them that impression that you can't deliver and own the issue. All right, the ball never leaves your court until the ticket is closed. You have to own it. A project management system. So on projects, uh, do most of you guys work in projects? Is that typically the way it works for your organizations? Okay. So you're not getting so much as much the support tickets. You're getting more of the project stuff. All right. So we just hired a project management professional uh, for our organization to try to refine our processes. So um, everyone can always do improvement on this. We, we've been pretty good at it, but, but not great. And he's really given me a lot of pointers and helped us grow our, our project management. So project management system, in a system like that, think of it like a ticketing system, except for it's got the Gantt charts and it's got phases and everything else. So in there, you're gonna estimate the project time and track, and track to actual. So you might say this project should take six hours, but if it took eight hours, well, what does that mean? It means you didn't calculate the, that amount right, or you had scope creep. 
You guys ever start a project and then it starts to change along the way and, and you're like looking at it going, well, you know, I thought it would take four hours. Now the business unit's looking at me, say, or 50 hours, and the business unit's looking at me going, well, you're at 100 hours. You told us it would only be 40 hours or whatever, right? You guys ever have that before? Any, any of those things where it just kind of, your day's going along and all of a sudden they're like mad at you and you don't know why? So I've been working on this the whole time. <laughs> well, that's usually project creep, you know, scope creep. Well, you need to do change orders for that stuff. No one can blow up your project unless you let them, okay? The organization may make a change. Make it the person who asked for the change responsibility to get approval from management. Get that in writing and then do a change order inside your project management system and put sign off on it, okay? If you do that, again, it doesn't fall on you. You can show your value because people don't know what you do. Uh, or create phases and milestones. Everything should be a phase and a milestone. Communicate regularly and consistently with stakeholders. Create change orders for all deviations from initial plan and, and recalculate timelines and own the project. Don't hand the project off to anyone else. You own it, okay? You can do, like on our system, you can do workflow rules. You can do all kinds of things that can put some of the responsibility on others, but you do need to own it. And the ball ne never leaves your court until the project is closed. You know what's the worst thing that, as an owner of a business, you want to hear, or even a manager is, well, I gave that to Susie, or I gave that to Bob, and I don't know where Bob's at. I don't know what he's doing. Well, but wasn't that your project? Yes, but this is Bob's part, and I don't know what Bob's doing, and I can't move ahead until Bob does his part. I, I just need you to make it work. Make my life easy, right? Like, own it. Someone own it, okay? All right, so this is an interesting thing. I've never seen an organization that uses these. Uh, I'm throwing it out there. I don't know if it's something you guys would want to do or not, but... I think it's fantastic. We use satisfaction surveys on all of our tickets. Every ticket that gets closed from anyone that, support, that sends us a ticket in or a project gets a satisfaction survey. How do we do? And oh my gosh, the customer satisfaction went through the roof for us as soon as we did this. And, and I get negatives. Um, in fact, I got a negative a while back. Well, actually, when we first, we first put this system in, I got a negative review and it was scathing. It was awful. It's like, I keep sending in emails and no one's responding and I'm not getting anything back. And so I went and looked in the system and I'm, I don't see them. They're not in there. Like, that's weird. And so I looked in our spam filter. He was forwarding us emails that were spam, asking if they were spam, and our system was blocking them, so they weren't going into our ticketing <laughs> system. <laughs> so I, I sent him a $50 Amazon gift card and said, sorry, we're going to turn that off for you guys, so you'll, we'll be able to get your spam emails and classify them for you. So, um, but, but we really like satisfaction surveys. They're really inexpensive. So if you get a ticketing system, and this is predicated on getting a ticketing system, is you put an append, you append on the end of a closed ticket that you have resolved the issue and then it has in there where they can do a smiley face, frowny face or whatever, right? Well, that's how you're gonna find out how people view the work that you're doing. And then what's amazing about that is then when you go in for your performance evaluation or you're evaluating your employees, you go look at those. Well, nobody really likes Bob. Why don't people like Bob? Well, right here it says Bob's a jerk. <laughs> and there's like 500 of these Bob's a jerk. Well, maybe I need to figure out what's wrong with Bob before the entire organization tries to burn my department down, right? So they're not expensive to do. Uh, they're, they're called CSAT, Customer Satisfaction Surveys, and there's a bunch of companies that do them, and they're fantastic. And then this down here at the bottom, um, larger organizations can benefit from public-facing facing dashboards that dis display active projects, tickets, and performance stats. This is what we use. We use a product called BrightGage. There's a bunch of these out there. If you get a ticketing system that's really robust, uh, it may have all this reporting out there, um, but if it doesn't, you can use this kind of product uh, to usually tie in with a lot of the ticketing systems. What I love about this is in my office, I have two 75-inch TVs. When you walk through my front door, you walk between these two TVs. My whole office can see them. We can see how many tickets are open, how long they've been open, um, you know, how stale tickets are getting, have we had waiting on response from customer. Uh, everything you can imagine about a ticket or a project is on this board, and my whole team has to walk by it daily. And if I walk by it and I look at it and I say, oh, we've got five tickets that haven't been responded to in an hour, I'm going to start yelling, <laughs> you know, because, because that's not how we operate, right? So you can actually show value to your customers. If, you have a, if you're in a larger department, put some TVs up with some metrics about what's going on within your department so people can see what you're doing. Again, this is another great way that's not real expensive to show value. So anyone here familiar with Patrick Lencioni? Hungry, uh, his phrase, hungry, humble, and smart? Does that ring a bell? Um, ideal team player? Um, if you've never read that book, 
read it. If you're managing people, you have to read that book. It is fantastic. Get it on Audible. I, I do Audible books all the time. Fantastic book. So what he says is leaders who can identify, hire, and cultivate employees who are humble, hungry, and smart will have a serious advantage over those who cannot. And we took that to heart in our organization. Hungry, humble, and smart. So hungry, they want to do the job. They're humble. It means they're not arrogant. And in IT, we've got a lot of arrogant people in IT. Uh, we do. I was one at one time. And then I met a lot of smarter people than me and had to humble myself. Uh, and, so, and then uh, uh, smart people. Now, when he talks about smart, there is skills and there's smarts, but he's also talking about intellectual, or not intellectual, um, uh, emotional maturity. So, I mean, you guys have probably dealt with people who are not emotionally mature, and that's a real toxic thing for your business, a lot toxic th thing for your department. So he's talking about emotional maturity. So, so if, what I, when, the reason I bring this slide up is because if you want to know how to impress your boss, assume he read this book, read the book yourself, and match what he's looking for. Because that's what, that's what everyone's looking for, whether they know it or not, is hungry, humble, and smart. And we hold up every candidate in my organization to that benchmark. That's it. That's all I've got. Um, I, do, I do want to take some questions, but before we do, I want to give away a prize. Who can tell me what movie made this stapler famous? I didn't see. Who was it? Right there? OK. <laughs> all right, so we got Office Space the movie on DVD, because people still use DVDs. Yeah, and a stapler. So now you'll have your own red swing line stapler. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so. So, any questions for me? I have one. Do you have a project management system that you suggest? To we we have one we use, uh -huh. um, and and we sell it. So I don't I don't want to be salesy. <laughs> uh, but uh, if I was to tell you what to use, the new PMP that just came in, he actually took everything out of our system and put it in Microsoft Project. So okay. if you're on Office 365, it's not a real expensive subscription. Okay. I would I would probably start with start that. Start there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Are you all local? We're in Tulsa. Tulsa. Yeah. So, so, but we do serve all of uh, Oklahoma. So we've got customers as far as Shattuck, Oklahoma, and we just got one last year in Calgary, Canada. So if anyone's in Calgary, we can <laughs> serve. Net fabric? Yeah. Rings a bell, but. That's all it does. So. <laughs> <laughs> managing, you know, like um, you're talking about ticketing and things mm -hmm. like that, do you find that um, even if nothing is done with it, that things that are measured tend to improve? Yes, it, well, there's a saying, right? What gets, what gets measured gets managed. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, that is, that's, that's, that saying should be like in your vocabulary in IT. What gets measured gets managed. If you're not measuring it, you cannot manage it. So. Should be able to. and be able to yeah. branch off of that and try to get where we yeah. can measure because the emails are driving us insane. So, so yep. I, I actually, um, I manage the forms in the, in the, and I was having the same issue. People were emailing me and I couldn't like, keep up with where I, where yeah. it was and so I actually tapped tap into ours and our IT created me one yeah. and I actually use it with the business office to release information too. Yeah. You, you can even do it for your maintenance department at a hospital. I mean, everyone should and be doing that. For things like that, um, housekeeping, you yep. know, ticketing systems, things like that, but I've never really thought of it from our professional perspective. Yep. But as you were talking, I was like, man, I would love to get away from our email groups and how to divide the work out to, amongst the team. So One of, one of the other things we like to push people to do, which I've never had anyone take me up on it, is like start billing departments. 
you know, if, if you have a department that's really needy, like maybe a surgery department with a lot of doctors, and they're demanding that the carts are, you know, in the right corner of the room instead of the left corner of the room <laughs> every day, and they put a ticket in or whatever, you know, if you do that, you can then show that, hey, our, you know, in my case, we call it a fully burdened cost. My fully burdened cost is $75 an hour, and because he wants that cart moved from the left side of the room to the right side of the room, it's costing you guys $3,000 a month in labor to do that. Do you want to continue to foot that bill? So even if you don't actually build the department, you can create those reports because you can usually, most ticketing systems, you can break it down in project system, break it down by department, and you can allocate those costs. And it, again, it gives you the budget you need to grow your organization. Yeah. And for us, just educating the other departments of where it's occurring and knowing where to focus that education effort would be, yeah. Absolutely. You can use it for um, like terminating employees and who needs their access terminated and sending that to we have a lot of that, but I've just not seen it in the HIM space as much for some of the things we yep. use. And we, we incorporated a form system with our ticketing system for specific things like if you got a new uh, employee getting hired, well, you got to have an email address, you got to have a phone with an extension. And so we use a software called Cognito Forms. If you guys have not heard of that, there's another one called. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's a really, really popular one. But it's just an online form system, and most, a lot of these are HIPAA compliant, and they're not real expensive. So you can go and create like 50 forms really quickly, and they'll force people to walk through before they can put a ticket in. So then they can't put in tickets like something broke. It's like, oh, okay, well, what's your name? You know, what's your email address? You know, what, what is broke? You know, but you can force them through that form system where it's mandatory fields before a ticket can ever go in. And we found that really cuts down the cost for our customers on our services. Because if you tell me something broke, my tech's going to get on the phone and, well, what's broke? Well, everything. Okay, well, we're going to be on here for an hour. Should have been a 10-minute resolution, but it's going to be a long time. So. More questions? I think I may be running out of time. How am I doing on time? Am I? You're actually finished up really still got about 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, so I am an IT guy, so if you don't have questions about this, I can answer any questions about cybersecurity or anything. So any, any. All IT guys wizards. <laughs> we have some warlocks and witches too. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, it, you know, it's funny you say that because even as an IT guy, we see that same thing and it's, it's like, we don't like it because I want to fix something because it's going to come back later. But sometimes we'll get on a computer, it's like something's wrong and we get on the computer, it's like, well, it looks fine. Well, it's working fine now. It's like, yeah. Uh, I just think y'all are wizards. Yeah. So. <laughs> What's the strangest ticket you've ever received? Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. How many times have you I don't have a. I don't know if I have a strangest ticket. Um, you know, I, the most common tickets, like the ones that, this is this is usually fascinating to people. They they hear this is, when you're paying for a third party IT company or even your own in house IT, you think that the cost is in the infrastructure you're building things and the guys are designing stuff and they're monitoring that network. No, most of your cost is going into fixing printers and resetting passwords. Yeah. <laughs> The, those are the things that take most of your money away. I mean, it's, there's a calculation in our industry that the, this guy uh, came up with this years ago and it's very accurate. And it says a well-run network, very well-run network, will utilize about 30 minutes of support per employee per month. So if you have a 100 employee company, you're gonna use about 50 hours of support a month, okay? So that 50 hours, probably half or more of that is password resets. <laughs> And printer fixes. <laughs> if you can standardize on printers, you'll cut that number way down. If you allow, if you work for an organization that just goes and buys printers at Best Buy, not so great. <laughs> More questions? You want? That's all I've got. Thank you for having me. <laughs>